Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2007 film Trick or Treat, which I have right here. Now, this is my only my second year in October having this wonderful Blu-ray to watch it off of. Prior to this, I was just watching this film from a DVD, which was the best quality we could get. Now, this is a 2007 film, but it was only released in 2009 because after it was finished in 2007, the studio didn't know what to do with it for two years, so it just sat on a shelf until they decided to just release it direct to DVD. Now, I was lucky enough that in 2009, I just happened to find it. They didn't really promote it or anything. It just become more of a cult following film as people have discovered it over time. And I think this year is kind of the peak of its popularity. And I think it's just going to keep going and going and going from there. So I've been loving this film for, what, 11 years now? And um, I'm, I'm loving seeing other people joining me with this. It is a, it's a tradition of mine that I always watch it every Halloween night after I'm done giving out candy. Or this year was a little bit different, but typically after I'm done giving out candy. So anyway, let's get into more details about this film, which I love. Written and directed by Michael Dougherty, who wrote uh, X2, X-Men United, Urban Legends, Bloody Mary, Superman Returns, I didn't know that one, and wrote and directed Krampus, which, by the way, if people don't know, the film Krampus, uh, it's been confirmed, Michael Dougherty said in an interview, that in his mind when he did Krampus, Krampus is in the same universe as Sam from Trick or Treat, so technically they could meet each other at some point. So when I heard that, I got excited. That's pretty cool. They're in the same universe. He also wrote and directed Godzilla, King of the Monsters. And I don't think he's directing, but I think he's involved in Godzilla versus King Kong that's going to be coming out. So just so people know that. The big names in this, obviously at the time, Anna Paquin, uh, who plays Lori in this, which by the way, yes, the name Lori was picked because of Lori Strode in Halloween. So just know that. Uh, there are a lot of... Um, a lot of small things that were done in Trick or Treat that were kind of pointing to influential horror films, and Anna Paquin's character being named Laurie was one of them. Uh, so Paquin was in the X-Men films, she was in the film Darkness, she was in the show True Blood, which I really did not like, that wasn't a good show, uh, although I know a lot of people loved it, that's just my personal thing, um, and Scream 4. Now, Brian Cox is one of the other big names in this, and I love Brian Cox. He's such a good actor, and he's wonderful in this film. I mean, all the acting, for the most part, is quite good in this. Uh, Brian Cox has been in, well, first of all, he has 224 IMDb credits, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but a, a few select films he's been in, Manhunt, Manhunter, Braveheart, Kiss the Girls, Rushmore, Super Troopers, The Ring, Zodiac, Rise of the Planet of the Apes, the Autopsy of Jane Doe, and more recently, the show Succession on HBO. Um, I love him in The Autopsy of Jane Doe, by the way. If you have not seen that film, definitely see that film. Not just for Brian Cox, but also for Emile Hirsch. He does a wonderful job in it, and it's just an awesome film. I love the story on that film. So good. And then maybe a lesser-known actor, but I think is awesome, Dylan Baker. Now, this individual's been in such things as The Last of the Mohicans, Happiness, The Cell, Along Came a Spider, Changing Lanes, and Fido. Which, by the way, Fido is a pretty solid uh, horror comedy, just so people know. But Dylan Baker, awesome. He plays Wilkins. Um, awesome, awesome actor. Other considered titles for Trick or Treat were October the 31st, Halloween Terrors, and Jack-O-Lantern Tales. I'm glad they went with Trick or Treat, honestly, but... If I had to pick one of the other ones, I would have said Jack-O-Lantern Tales would have been the best of the other ones, but glad they went with Trick or Treat. So this is based on an animated short that Michael Dougherty had done in 1996 that he called Season's Greetings, and if you get something like this Blu-ray, or I think it's even on the, D the old DVD that I have back there in my stack somewhere, uh, they have the animated short available on those as a special feature so it's kind of interesting to see where it all started and it features sam and that's where everything started from so very good um I already talked about that initially a sequel to this film was talked about in 2009 then it was announced in 2013 that they were going to do it and then in 2017 it was said to hopefully be worked on after Dougherty is finally done with all this Godzilla business. Now, I remember hearing at one point that after he was done doing Godzilla King of Monsters, that he was going to start working on the script for Trick or Treat 2. Maybe he has started working on it a little bit, 
but now they're basically saying that he has some involvement with Godzilla versus King Kong, so most likely we wouldn't get anything after that. Now, fingers crossed it actually happens. Um, I'm wondering if maybe they get done with that, and then it's like on to something else, and then it's delayed again, so we'll see. Uh, Krieg, the character of Krieg, played by Brian Cox, is supposed to look like John Carpenter in this film. Just so people know. That's a thing that's been said. I think Michael Dougherty said it before. They made him intentionally look like John Carpenter. And there are a bunch of John Carpenter things in this film. Obviously the fact that Anna Paquin's named Laurie for Laurie Strode. The fact that Krieg looks like John Carpenter. The fact that also, uh, if you look closely in the, the flashback scene with the school bus situation... There is a 1958 Plymouth Fury that shows up, which is obviously an homage to the John Carpenter film Christine, based off the Stephen King book Christine. Um, yeah, and Sam is named for Sam Hain, you know, the or, one of the origins or the origin of Halloween. In the school bus mass, oh, I, already, I literally just said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no deaths actually happen on screen in this film. That's something to note, and it's interesting because. That's not something I had thought about, but when I read that in my research, I was like, wait a minute. Is that true? Do no deaths actually happen on screen? Because we have this tendency as, as human creatures, for our brains will kind of fill things in. So when there are things in in um, in films where it like alludes to someone being killed, our brain will fill it in and make us think that we saw the death happen when it was actually off screen. So I had to kind of like reach back and be like, huh. and I'm like, oh yeah, there really aren't any like on screen deaths. Even though the kid in the beginning is throwing up blood and chocolate and stuff and then, like, falls over, that's not necessarily him dying. Um, yeah. And then also the, uh, I guess the next closest one would be the, uh, the, the werewolf situation. Um, some other small things to note about the film that were very interesting. So there's a portion during the fight between Sam and Krieg where a gumball comes kind of um, bouncing down the stairs. That was meant to be an homage to the film The Changeling, which if you have not seen The Changeling, you should definitely see it. It's a good film. Krieg's line where he says, you got to be effing kidding me. Um, I don't want to say it on here because of, you know, you know what I'm saying. Um, that is actually a nod to John Carpenter's remake of The Thing because there's that part where one of the characters says that, about, I think it's the portion where the head of the one guy had detached from the body when they were burning it, and then they see it walking, and they say that exact same line. So another nod to John Carpenter. The beginning portion, okay, this is where I'm actually starting to talk about, like, my feelings on the film and what I see in the film. So the beginning portion of the film is actually the end of the events, which you end up finding out at the end of the film. I like how the fact that um, everything is represented. In, in, in this portion of it. So, if you note, the very beginning, it shows, who you find out later, is Rhonda pulling with her wagon a pumpkin through the street, and then a car almost hits her. So, in the end, you find out that, for A, that is Rhonda. B, the people in the car who almost hit her are the werewolf females. Uh, you also see in the background of one of the shots in the very beginning, Krieg's house, and then also it's important to note that the pumpkin that is in the wagon that Rhonda is pulling is the pumpkin that they get from Wilkins house when they ask them ask him if they could have one of his jack-o'-lanterns and he says you're not going to smash it are you uh, so all of the stories are represented in that opening shot and i think it's really cool that you don't really know that until the very end so much so that's one of the things i like how things are kind of cleverly cleverly done in this film and one of the big things being kind of the how the the stories really intertwine with each other now that wasn't initially what was supposed to happen initially the film was supposed to just be blocks of these stories and sam would just show up in all of them to kind of tie them all together now it was the studio's idea to actually mix them up and have the timelines all all mixed up and they kept kind of crossing over and Michael Dougherty, I think to this day, still doesn't like that idea. He kind of wishes he did it as blocks. But I'm glad they went that way because I think it's better. I think it's more interesting. It took me a bunch of viewings, honestly, to figure out kind of the events of like, oh, okay, now this person's showing up in this and, and this takes place before this. And, you know, the implications that it ends up having for that reason. So I'm glad they ended up doing it that way. Um, 
<laughs> the very very beginning which uh is the the part where the girl gets killed eventually with the lollipop uh typical middle-aged couple um done well because they're very uh believable as being that age you know 30 somethings who are kind of you know they went out they partied they're tired the woman uh the guy just wants to go to sleep the woman wants to clean everything up so they don't have to deal with it in the morning so yeah although you know in every relationship i think there are two people like that in every every relationship for the most part but it can end up switching it can be you know the guy wants to clean up and the girl wants to go to sleep which is kind of how it is in my relationship Sam attacking the woman. I think it's very interesting to note that the sounds that are being made when he's actually attacking her under the sheet sound like a feral animal. They really do. And I think for that reason, it ends up being particularly effective and kind of scary initially, especially with the music that they have coming in at that point. Uh, the reveal of the woman's head on the that wooden, um, I guess, kind of like two by four or whatever, uh, is a little bit comedic. It, I mean, it is gruesome and it's kind of scary, but it's also a little bit comedic because of the fact that it's a giant lollipop that's jammed into her mouth and how it stretches her mouth out. So it's like gross and shocking and scary, but it's also kind of lighthearted and comedic just because of that lollipop. And I love the fact that in the fight where, you know, I'm kind of going back and forth on the stories here, but in the fight that he has with Krieg, when you first see the lollipop come out and he bites it, that they give you that at the end and then lead you right back up to the scene where in the you're shown in the beginning where the woman ends up getting killed with it and it's shoved in her mouth. So I love that you see the creation of it when he bites into it. Uh, the werewolves trying on costumes is great because on the second viewing, you kind of start to catch all the extra dialogue. And then, I mean, really throughout their storyline, you catch all these hints at wolves and werewolves. And, you know, she was always the runt of the litter was one of the things. And how they talk about um, people in a food way, but you don't really get that until you watch it a second time. Such as um, the part where the one girl says, I ate bad Mexican. She doesn't say Mexican food. She just says, I ate bad Mexican. Um, so you kind of get it you know, on the second viewing. Uh, the other thing to point out is in that scene with the costume, when there's that little kid and I think it's like a monkey costume and he's, he's eating a lollipop, which is a signal right there. And he's kind of peeking in on them changing. That is Quinn Lord. Who's the kid who played Sam in the film. So that is what he looked like without his Sam stuff on. I just thought that was cool. If you notice when the two girls are talking to the film crew guys, um, when they're trying to, you know, find their dates. If you notice, one of them kind of spaces out until the other one kind of like, you know, elbows her. And you can tell on the second viewing that it's because she's she's not ogling him from like, in like a sexual way. She's ogling him in like a I'm hungry, he looks like a pot roast kind of way. And they play differently. The first time you're watching it, you think that she's kind of distracted by how good the guy looks. And then the second time you're like, oh, she's thinking food. So I love how it plays both ways. The kid dying from eating the candy is pretty shocking. Um, especially when you see him burying the bodies later, Wilkins that is. So you really, I mean the first viewing, you really don't see that coming. And I remember on my first viewing, I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And then even further, it gets even darker. And then he's, you know, burying not only that body, but another body, at least one other body. There may be more. And then everything with his kid and the fact that you, like, you believe that he's about to kill his kid when he goes in to help him out. I mean, but I'm going to backtrack a little bit on that. Note what candy bar Sam gets when he shows up at Wilkins house and he sticks his hand into his bowl of candy and pulls it out. Um, it, notice that it's it's that candy bar, that full-size candy bar with the red wrapper. Now, that's the one he pulls out during his fight with Krieg, the one that he uses to cut his Achilles tendon, which is a reference to Pet Cemetery, by the way, by Stephen King. Um, so just know that. When he sticks his hand out from under the, uh, the bed and cuts his Achilles tendon. So that candy bar came from Wilkins. So once again, another thing of something from this story passing over to one of the other stories. It's very cool. Um, the interactions that Wilkins has with his son and Krieg, I think are very funny. I love the comedy of that portion of the film. And I love when you see Krieg ending up getting tackled by Sam, but Wilkins isn't even looking anymore because the other great thing is that you see that same scene, that same event, but from the other perspective, from inside of Krieg's house. 
And that's just, it's cool that you get that. Um, and that's like, like I say, it's one of the things I love about this film. They really do set things up for you to think that Wilkins is going to stab his son, but what's revealed is actually even more shocking uh, because the kid is involved, you realize, at that point. not It's not a situation where Wilkins is hiding this from his child. He's indoctrin indoctrinating him with this killer, I want to say killer instinct, but no, this killer um, occupation, I guess, in a way. But it's, it's disturbing, it's gross, it's crazy. Uh, but it's, it works really well. The kids pulling the prank on Rhonda is something believable for for kids of that age, and it's effective because you end you actually end up feeling bad for some of those kids before they end up getting killed because they show some remorse. Schrader, in particular, you know, he's the one who kind of cozies up to Rhonda in the beginning, and then he goes along with the the plot to scare her which he realizes gets out of control. Then he starts feeling bad. He wants to take care of her. He tells Macy to kind of screw off. Uh, he's like, we scared her enough, didn't we? You know, can you leave her alone? So you then feel bad for him. Uh, you don't, you know, as much feel bad for Macy, but you feel bad for pe for like Schrader. Um, so yeah, it, it effectively done in, in my opinion. The story of the school bus is incredibly sad. Uh, it's also very deeply affecting. And the way they shot the aftermath uh, when it, when it's the shot of, you know, the bus going over the cliff and then the camera going over and then, you know, looking down into the quarry and you see the bus sinking in as all the bubbles are coming up and then they focus more on the water and the, the masks start coming up to the surface. That shot looks amazing. It looks so, so good. Uh, I really, really enjoy that. Lori looking at all the couples at the Halloween celebration gives you the idea that she's looking for companionship. That she's kind of looking at all these people and thinking, oh, you know, why can't I have someone? But on the second viewing, you realize that's not what's going on at all. But it's it plays like that to make you think that this is a relationship-related thing. The werewolf reveal scene at the bonfire is probably my favorite part of the film. Uh, the only crappy aspect to this film is the fact that the CGI, the, the bit of CGI that's used doesn't hold up, and this goes back to one of the things that I say all the time in all my reviews is, if you can use practical effects, use practical effects, because the CGI will never hold up. CGI always looks better in the future. It won't hold up, but practical effects will hold up for the most part. So, uh, but that scene is so well done. I love the fact of all these, you know, all the girls tearing their skin off. That's a cool aspect of the werewolf change. They're taking them off the way they take off clothing, I love that kind of parallel of that. Um, the fact that you, you know, everything comes to realization and you're thinking back at that point, oh my gosh, none of this was about a relationship. This was all about eating people. This is crazy. And this is Anna Paquin's character, well, Lori's first time eating someone at this bonfire. And the music, the Marilyn Manson cover of Sweet Dreams works so, so well with that. Uh, there was another song that was supposed to be playing during that initially, can't remember what it was but I'm glad that they didn't go with it because I, I remember whatever it was when I found it I was like oh yeah that would not have been as good uh there is a great job done of uh painting Krieg as a terribly grumpy old curmudgeon uh and Brian Cox pulled that role off very very well uh this probably stems from the bus situation which you don't actually connect until the very end of the film when you see that photo of him with the kids and the bus burning in his fireplace uh, the Krieg versus Sam fight is a good length, and it actually stays pretty fresh throughout, so I like that. Uh, once again, like I said, note that the Achilles tendon cut is like Pet Cemetery. I love that you see the lollipop turned into the weapon, since it was the, an important piece of the beginning of the film. Once again, kind of bringing things full circle. I do like the dead kids coming for Krieg and it ending in the comic book version. You know, not actually showing what's going on, but go over to the artwork of the comic book of him getting torn apart by these kids. So, love it. Uh, so, some closing thoughts on Trick or Treat. Uh, this feels like Halloween because it's steeped in it and plays like a love letter to the holiday. And that's one of the things I love about this so much. Halloween's my favorite holiday. I, I love it every single year. And so, movies like this end up becoming favorites of mine because it puts me even more in the mood. It makes me feel 
the holiday even more. So um, Michael Dougherty did a great job with that. This has so much rewatch value. Like I was talking about, you know, on your first view, you see this. On your second view, you see this. But it keeps going. You see new things all the time. And um, it's just a fun, it's a fun film. It has a lot of rewatch value. It's funny. It's scary. It's gross. It's interesting. All that stuff. The four stories chart the typical human's experience with Halloween and how that changes during different ages. Because if you notice, each of these stories has to do with a different stage of life. Um, you know, with the kids playing the trick, it's obviously like, you know, teenage type um, age. Then you go to the werewolves and it's like their 20s, you know, just not long after being able to start drinking. Then you go to uh, the couple in their 30s who are, you know, cleaning up after a night of partying. Then you go to Wilkins, who's probably in his 40s or 50s. And then you go to Krieg, who's probably in his late 60s, early 70s, somewhere in there. So uh, it was intentionally done this way. From what I read, that Michael Dougherty wanted it to be that way. He wanted it to be each story would represent a different phase in a person's life and how they typically interact with the holiday of Halloween. So I think that's really, really cool. If you notice, Sam always shows up in each story when deaths occur. But in the bus flashback, he shows up before death occurs. And I don't know if there's a significance to that, but it's just something that I observed that I was like, every time he's showing up in these stories, it's when death is happening or just happened. Uh, typically when it's happening. Um, now... For some reason, it's not the case with the with the flashback, and I don't know what that is. So if you have a theory on that, go ahead and put it in the comments. But that's all I have to say about Trick or Treat. Now, I know I said it's one of my favorite films. I love it so much, but I will also admit it's not a perfect film. It's, it d will not garner a five-star rating. It's not the most phenomenal thing ever. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I am giving it a four-and-a-half-star rating. I can't give it a perfect, but I can get it pretty close. I love this film. I think it's very good. At their, and like I said, a lot of rewatch value. So let's nerd out about it. Let me hear your thoughts on it. There, I, I'm sure there are people out there who don't like it, and that's fine. And you can tell me why. That's totally good. So let's talk. Let's get nerdy. Um, and if you could, please do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Uh, it means a lot to me when people do that. If you like this video or any video I've ever done, that is your best way to repay me. Just hit the subscribe button. Also, just hit the notification bell, and then that way you know when I'm putting up a new review video or an unboxing or a lot doing a live stream or putting up another type of video because I'm doing some other stuff here and there as well. So regardless, I appreciate you taking the time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.